It's a new year, so let's see what 2025 brings to the EV world. Ideas, inventions, breakthrough, much, much more. I'm Dave. This is Dave Takes It On. Going to open with battery technology. We've got quite a divergence in philosophies emerging. And the reason is, like most things in life, there is not one single answer or product. Neo is the only one persisting with battery swap stations. They've just opened up their 30th station in Europe, covers Norway, Germany, Netherlands, Sweden and Denmark. Uh, by the way, they've got nearly 3,000 altogether, mainly in China, and they've just completed their 60 millionth battery swap. They also have 26 conventional charging stations in Europe with 46 connectors. Neo is on the up and up, and it's an upcoming manufacturer, roughly on a par with BMW, bigger than Mercedes, smaller than VW. Now there seems to be a market for these, and their stats actually look reasonably good. Average time to swap is around two or three minutes, that's faster than petrol lovers can manage. You get a fresh, checked battery every time, so no worry about degradation or life expectancy. Most charging stations have 20 batteries, so each station can change 20 cars per hour. During that hour, the flat batteries that have been removed will have recharged. That's 400 a day potential. The only downside I see is that the batteries have to be standardised. Each pack has to be the same type, size, capacity. Now, Neo can do that, but it effectively excludes all other makes unless they also adopt a single standard, the NEO standard for their batteries, also build in a standard, the removal fittings. That to me is the biggest stumbling block. Regarding battery chemistry, the first EVs with solid state batteries will be seen on the roads in 2025. And not one or two experimental ones is all we've had so far, but is this the answer? No, clearly not. China has gone down the road of cheaper, lower density LFP batteries to make their EVs much cheaper. It's not all subsidies. And well, that's working, mostly. The general trend in cars over the last two decades has been to build bigger and bigger petrol cars. That's likely, sooner or later, to be copied with EVs. But that is also not the entire market. Most of us don't buy and drive a huge 4x4 Chelsea tractor. We buy smaller, cheaper family runaround. So there is clearly a market for both. Solid state batteries have seven huge advantages if we can get them working. They're smaller, they're lighter, they're safer, they have higher energy density, they recharge in just a handful of minutes, they use fewer materials compared to lithium iron, and they can be charged five times more than NMC way beyond the lifetime of anything a driver will experience. But they are dearer and they might never get down to price parity, nor up into the automated, automated mass production. These will probably be limited to the premium or performance models in the future, where the higher price is not such an issue. Down at the lower end, most people do not even need LFP, so there's a huge amount of work going on into sodium ion batteries. Sodium is less abundant than lithium, but it's much more readily available and much cheaper and easier to extract. It's in seawater. Well, these are likely the future for the budget range of EVs once the energy density increases. Now, I'm going to drop down into really simple idiot language. You need to look at the main chemical, lithium, aluminium, sodium, whatever it is, as the bit that stores the ions. Cathodes grab those ions out of storage and send them down a wire, while the anode grabs them from the other end of the wire and puts them back into storage. That flow of ions is DC electricity. And before you ask, ions and electrons, they're both virtually the same. Simply charged particles, ions have a positive charge, electrons have a negative charge. The more powerfully and efficiently the cathodes and anodes operate, the more electricity you get out of the store. NMC and LFP are rapidly reaching their peak efficiency, while solid state and sodium iron are barely getting started. These will get much better, but I don't think that any one technology or chemistry will be the clear winner. 
you'll find more than one type of loaf of bread on a supermarket shelf. Well, full self-driving, robo-taxis and beyond. People do seem to have a very predetermined opinion on these subjects. Chalk and cheese, Marmite. Many claim, oh, it's never going to happen. Others point out, it actually already has. OK, full self-driving is a dream that's been around for more than 50 years. If you just look back at some of the old sci-fi films back then. Who was that? Demolition Man, Blade Runner, Fifth Element. Now, arguments against full self-driving always focus on a tiny, minuscule number of highly unlikely, verging on the impossible, scenarios where a driverless taxi would not be able to cope at all. Usually followed by a statement along the lines of, well, only when it's 100% perfect, guaranteed to have zero crashes and no instance for three years, then I might begin to consider getting into one. Well, that always reminds me of two hunters who suddenly encountered a lion and one screams, run for your life! But his partner laughs and says, why? You can't outrun a lion. And his partner replies, but I don't have to. I just have to run faster than you. You're the decoy. Now, Fiat FSD is exactly the same. Nothing is perfect in this world, so the idea that FSD can ever guarantee zero crashes, zero injuries and zero incidents, that's just plain silly. That will never happen. Nature will see to that. The tipping point will be when full self-driving becomes safer and better than human drivers. We're not perfect. No matter how much tuition we get or how many tests we take, we crash with a monotonous regularity. Approaching half a million crashes in the UK alone, more than half of them resulted in casualties and more than 1,500 in fatalities. We're not perfect because most of those are now classed not as accidents, but as collisions caused by human error. And here, an even scarier statistic leapt out during my research. In the UK, official data shows that an average of 63% of accidents are caused purely by human error. And that rises to about 75% in the major cities. That sounds perfectly feasible. In America, they have NHTSA, which is the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. And they claim that it's an absolutely staggering 94 to 96% are all caused by human error. Now, according to data released by Tesla, humans crash 1.53 times for every million miles driven. Yet current FSD beta systems, they're not full systems yet, only crash 0.31 times per million miles. Seems to me that if this is accurate in America and their existing FSD beta uh, is, is that good, should be made compulsory tomorrow. It's ready. It's already better than humans. So I thought, check China. Now, they had in 2023 60,000 plus uh, incidents, and that's increased rapidly in the recent years. Police stated, anecdotally, over 90% over of them were human error. But when you look into a lot more detail, you analyse it, the figure's near as 75%. So we in the UK do quite well. Well, I doubt I would ever want to drive in America. Top reason for the crashes were bad state and bad behaviour. Bad state is basically not being fit to drive, so fatigue, you're drunk, not paying attention. While bad behaviour is doing things wrong, speeding, driving too close, going through red lights, overtaking with not enough clearance. Is it necessary to point out that all these are actually impossible in a full self-driving car? Well, full self-driving is not here at the moment, but it should be introduced at the very earliest opportunity in all countries. It should also be welcomed by all road users and all pedestrians, as this is designed to keep all of them safe and healthy. Well, humanoid robots, that's an evocative subject. They're undergoing huge advancements in practicality, along with massive drops in cost of production and price, especially in car factories, which are still very heavily reliant on human manual labour. Robots have been in operation for more than 50 years, but these have always had a single massive snag. They're bolted to the floor. 
They painted cars, welded chassis, bolted doors to the body shell, but all were bolted down while human labour could wander around to wherever it was needed. 2025 is likely to see huge leaps forward in advanced humanoid robots. These are EVs, of course, just with legs rather than wheels. And prices are tumbling. Boston Dynamics, everyone quotes, as numerous changes of ownership as it found out the hard way that robots, costing several million each that could do very limited, simple, menial tasks, had a very limited market. Even the very much cheaper Spot the Dog, rumoured to cost around about $75,000 each, that's only sold about a thousand units ever. There is simply not much demand for a dog-like robot. Yet we have millions of humans labouring in car factories around the world. Well, this year we're seeing some of the major car manufacturers take a massive interest in humanoid robots. Hyundai, Hyundai, yeah, Hyundai recently bought Boston Dynamics and BMW launched their own design. Very advanced, they claim the most advanced in the world. They are the future and will increasingly take over the manual, boring, repetitive jobs or the dangerous ones. They will also be expected to operate round the clock, 24 hours a day, with brakes, if required, for charging the relatively small battery pack. I say if required, because the robot can of course be plugged in and charging while it's still carrying out different tasks. No brake is needed. Well, the first company to mass produce fully capable humanoid robots on a mass scale is going to become an absolute giant in the manufacturing world. The overall market is larger than, oh, it's larger than anything, larger than there are people on the planet. You see, not only could each home have one or more, but they will work in factories, on board ships, on farms, laying new roads, digging ditches, building houses. Ironically, they're also going, going to end up making more of themselves. In 2025, we'll begin to see the scope these have. Now, air taxis. Well, drones have taken over the world. If we don't have one, we know someone who does. Uh, and these are also electric vehicles. This year, it was a best choice Christmas present for many kids around the world. Uh, it didn't take long before people realised that far from being a toy, if you can program a drone to fly a set route, land safely and quickly, avoiding all traffic, and with no human intervention, then there's a market for making them big enough to start carrying parcels. And if you can carry parcels, why not humans? So it begins. And don't even bother saying they're never going to work. Amazon is actually using them already. In fact, you may well have already received a parcel from one. They are here and they're working. But you can afford to lose a parcel or two, or even the parcel and the drone, if things go wrong. You cannot afford to do the same with passengers on board. But they can quite happily and easily carry people. These are also already here and working. Now, commercial licences are really scarce at the moment, a bit like rocking horse droppings, but often the reasons for delays is more social than technical. Who's liable in the event of a crash? How can we sure, be sure they won't run into each other? How safe are they? But these are being worked through and each will be resolved in time. As will the range and the speed and the carrying capacity. We forget, at one time, we hand-cranked our petrol engines. I remember that, and required a man with a red flag walking in front as we drove. Don't remember that. Aircraft only carried one or two operators, usually a pilot and a bomber, uh, and they were incapable of crossing the English Channel. Technology moves on constantly. How long will it be before we get a two- or four-man drone that can fly for a thousand miles, at speeds of well over 200 miles an hour. See, that would make a holiday in Barcelona for a family from Manchester, a journey of three or four hours in a private air taxi. And that would make it a realistic alternative to get into the airport three hours ahead of time, paying for parking, flying for three hours and queuing up for hours to get your luggage. It'll make all that a thing of the past. Just book one online, lands outside your home, takes you there in three, four hours. They're currently at the red flag stage, certainly, but it will not be like that and it won't be long before we can get into one for a holiday. Without having a pilot or crew to pay, 
they should actually be quite cheap. From there, fully electric passenger aircraft are then likely to follow. Well, linked to solid state batteries that offer massive power density and range with incredibly quick recharge times, their future is all but guaranteed. People don't realise a Boeing 747 flying from London to New York will burn about 70,000 kilograms of fuel, 70 tonnes, tonnes, jet fuel, and that costs more than $50,000, or around about $100 per passenger. And here is a fascinating statistic. There are more than 10,000 people alive today in the UK who, when they were born, could not even get on a passenger plane as they didn't exist at that time. Oh, last thing, newsflash, nuclear fusion is advancing rapidly. It's likely to be a reality in the next, you guessed it, 20 years. So no more power cuts. <laughs> well, thanks very much for watching. I'm Dave. If you have enjoyed this, please click the like button. And subscribe to follow along. Thank you for watching Dave Takes It On. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, can't think of anything interesting no, to no. say. <laughs>